Executive Director of the Rhode Island Historical Society. He has also co-authored a number of books, including one by the poem, The Bird of the Rocks. Ladies and gentlemen, we're proud to have, happy to have him present this lecture on The Bird of the Rocks to us. Please join me in welcoming him. Well, 
He was trying to go the Northeast Passage. The big deal for all explorers was to go to Cathay, China. Get the riches, the spices. They wanted to go somewhere easy enough to get over. So they would try the Northeast or the Northwest. In this case, he tried the Northeast. He was turned by ice, very thick ice. He came back around. By the way, his boat was so small it could only hold 24 people. Just to give you an idea how small this was. He turned around and came all the way down the coastline of Canada and back up into what became known as Hudson's River. And they went all the way up to Albany where he finally realized that that wasn't the Northwest, the fabled Northwest Passage, which wouldn't actually be done until about 1904. It's the first time some uh, a ship was able to go through the Northwest Passage. And that took, well, something like two and a half years to do it complete. And that was the great Amundsen, the man who eventually uh, was the first to the South Pole. Now, the issue about 1609 is one thing. The issue about 1900, well, we like to get a demarcation point in all of our books. <clears throat> the Bronx, as we know it today, was actually formed very, very recently. The Bronx River has always been the dividing line. In 1874, all land west of the Bronx River was annexed, and I mean that, annexed to the greater city of New York, which was only composed at that time of Manhattan Island. In 1895, the eastern section of the Bronx, east of the Bronx River, was again annexed to the greater city of New York. In 1898, the other boroughs joined in. And those boroughs were, as we know, Staten Island, which should never really be part of us, it's so far away, <laughs> uh, uh, Brooklyn, Queens. Then they had to have a name for the area that had already been part of the city. It had been known as the 23rd and the 24th wards. They needed a name. So they took the single largest geographical feature, a river, a true river, that runs its entire length. The only, by the way, true river in the New York City area. The Hudson River is not really a river. It's a flooded estuary. In fact, the, the, uh, uh, it's only when you get above Poughkeepsie on the Hudson River that you're able to draw real water from it where it becomes a river. So here, what we have is they had to have a name. So for a long time, it was called the Annex District, or the Great North Side, the 23rd, 24th Ward, but we needed a name. So they took the name of the river, and that is why it's called the Bronx, because it's named after the Bronx River. Now, many people, it's like the first question everybody asks about the borough of the Bronx. We became one of the five boroughs in 1898, when the greater city of New York was established. So the greater city of New York is very young. In other words, truly young. We're talking about 108 years. But of course, Manhattan goes back, you know, to the year we were saying as a city in 1624 and even earlier, and of course people are traveling to and fro. But the Bronx was not one of the counties because politics never moved very far from Manhattan. What we have here is the Bronx was a Democratic bastion. So the Republicans in Tammany decided to hold, the, the other Tammany, decided to hold back those issues. And what they ended up doing was made the county of the Bronx non existent. So there wasn't a county of the Bronx, it was just Manhattan or New York County. So you have Manhattan, the borough, with New York County. And New York County included the Bronx until 1914, when finally the county of Bronx was established. So we're the last county in the state of New York. There are 62 counties, and there are buildings in Albany, our capital, the state's capital, that have all of the counties uh, uh, engraved upon it, all but one, the Bronx, which was made in 1910. We're the last county. And what does the county status give us? It gives us our, our own district attorney, a court system, uh, county clerk, important the sheriff back then. Is this very, uh, very important position. Now, the birth of the Bronx is an, is an enduring thing to myself. And I always like to start off with a little bit of reading. So we'll have shows, but we want to do a little reading as well. Here is a map, one of the first maps ever shown about the borough of the Bronx. It's called the Manitus map. And while you're, I'm reading from this, you take a look at it, see if you can pick out Where's Manhattan Island? This particular map was drawn in 1639. So it's one of the earliest maps that show the area. 
<coughs> this map is very important to us because it shows very distinctly the farm of Jonas Brock, B-R-O-N-C-K, who was a Danish sea captain. That's what we thought for many years. Turned out he was Swedish. He's a Swedish sea captain who came here in 1639 with some indentured servants, and he established a small farm right along what became known as Bronx's River. That's how the name got established, it was Bronx's River. That's where he stayed. But he also did something even more important for some people in that he left in 1641, establishing the tradition that has continued to this day. More people have lived in the Bronx and left it than any other part of the country. <laughs> <laughs> you go through the Cross Bronx Expressway, but you remember that. <laughs> so now we go back to this map. The original was drawn in 1639 for the West India Company. Of course, the West India Company, it's all of these cities and places were established very clearly for commercial, mercantile reasons. It has been lost, the original, but luckily a copy was made in 1670. In the, in the uh, legend we have here, it's difficult to read from where you are, but number 43 marks the farm of Jonas Brock, and 44, the plantation of Pierre Anderson, one of Brock's indentured servants. He was also known as the chimney sweep. The map is shown in color in its entirety on the end sheets, and that's what we did. End sheets, of course, are the inside of the cover, Beautiful book. How many people have this book? Not enough. Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a beautiful inside cover. Really, this book is a beautiful done book. Now, when we look at this, when we look at this, we can see, okay, now the North River, that's Hudson River. Okay, the North River. So what then is this? That's right. This then would be the Bronx. Okay, does that little help you a little bit? You'll get yeah, your yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, everything's not exact yet. Not exact by, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, you've got the Governor's Islands over here. You know, there's Staten Island. Island. And of course, over here is the Bronx. It's not really shown the Bronx River, but it goes along here. And these are the areas where Jonas Brown first set. The Great Hell's Gate is right through here. The dimension was blasted out. It's a very difficult, very difficult water. Which even to this day, I have to be very careful coming in here to come into what is the East River. East River is not a true river. It's just another arm of the sea. And then as you come up here, what have you got? The Harlem River. Again, a name that's just been established. It's just another arm of the sea. It comes around. Don't say shown as an island, but in fact, this was very difficult to get around. And it wasn't until 1939 that the U.S. Ship Canal established the fact that the Manhattan Island was big enough to take big steamers. And it was a big with, with uh, you know, some real dread. It was before that you did not have. It. So this is the Spike and Dino over here. Of course, as I said, that's Jersey and the rest of the country. You've seen that uh, famous uh, shot uh, of the, uh, at the, uh, the painter. Is. It's a New York magazine. And it showed New York City. It showed Hudson River. It said New Jersey. And then all of a sudden, it shows California. That was here. <laughs> very clear. Uh, Bronx sites are very specific. Bronx, by the way, Bronx sites and Brooklynites get along very well because we're neighborhood people. Queens is a problem because everybody gets lost in Queens. They've never been, they have 43rd Street, 43rd Place, 43rd Avenue. And it's an insane, and it's big, so that you can get lost and then you're far away from where you want to be. The Bronx is wonderfully placed because it's on the grid system. The perpendicular grid system is attached to the borough of the Bronx because, again, we were part of the city of New York before everyone else. And that's very important. That's why we have all the major train lines as well, all the subway lines. Now keep in mind, at one point in this country, you could get everywhere by trolley. Well, that's a little far, but at least in the, north, uh, the northeast. At one point, you can go from Boston through New York, down to Washington, back up to uh, Cleveland and Detroit, all by trolley. Now I admit, that's a lot of trolley. But nonetheless, you could do it. You'd have great difficulty doing that if not for Greyhound and these new bus services that are around. And a lot of people have trouble, especially in the small towns. They cannot get around enough. There aren't, there's no bus service. There's no service at all. OK, let's continue. Here's a, uh, a little, uh, a little you know, we're coming in a little farther. You can see we're 43 and 44. That's Jonas Brown. And that's what these things say here. 
Now, this is a, uh, an image of the great Henry Hudson. This is the third voyage of Henry Hudson. The fourth voyage was his final voyage. That's when he went all the way up into Canada into Hudson Bay, where he, there was a mutiny. And the, mutinies, the, the mutineers threw him and three or four others off the boat, we're still not sure how many, off the boat somewhere in the southern end of what is now Hudson Bay. No one has ever heard from them again. <laughs> we don't know what happened. But the ship managed to get back. And the second mate, who's actually involved in the mutiny, the mutiny, the, the, in the mutiny itself, actually wrote a piece. His name was Robert Jewett, J-U-E-T. And uh, we titled it, Henry Hudson Discovers the Bronx Coastline. Now, this is obviously a drawing done, actually a drawing done in the 1900s. Okay, And it shows the boat, what's supposed to be the half moon, located in the Hudson Highlands. With that sense of what that is. Uh, so Henry Hudson, commanding a ship for the Dutch West India Company, explored the river, which was ultimately named for him, hoping to find the fabled Northwest Passage, which would carry a ship from the Atlantic Ocean to the riches of the Orient. He was bitterly disappointed when the river's salt water turned fresh, somewhere around the tips, but he continued on until he went up to Albany, but he could not go any further, and he realized he's done. It wasn't until really the 19th century that you actually could go up the Hudson River, utilizing locks, and work your way through the Champlain Canal into Lake Champlain and work your way up into the St. Lawrence and then back out again. Very recent. When he uh, reached the vicinity of modern Albany, he ordered his crew, divided almost equally between Englishmen and Dutchmen, to reverse course and head south. The second mate, Robert Jewett, of the Limehouse District of London, kept a journal of the voyage, describing every adventure he witnessed in this new world. And on October 2nd, 1609, he recorded a skirmish with the Indian inhabitants further up the river and the crew's successful escape. That night, the tiny ship sought shelter from a storm in Spite and Diving Creek, which separated the mainland from Manhattan Island. It was while in this shel shelter that Jouet, the mate, penned the first description of the Bronx and the waters nearby. The white green cliff he mentions corresponds to Marble Hill, which had not yet been cut off from the island, the island of Manhattan, that is, and attached to the mainland by the destruction of the Harlem River ship canal. By the way, there is no picture of Henry Hudson, just like there's nothing of uh, Shakespeare. There's a lot of people who have no idea what they look like, but this was a, a conjectural rendering. We had a lot of discussion about whether we should put this in at all, but people actually liked the idea that, oh, that picture looks just like somebody they know. Well, not everybody I know. But nonetheless, his conjectural uh, uh, rendering of the great explorer, he was one of the great navigators, along with Captain Cook and Magellan. There were, there were only a handful. They could smell the air, the water, the wind. They just knew how to go. This fine fellow is Caleb Heathcote, the son of a wealthy merchant family in England, who left to seek his fortune in the new world. Well, is that such an unusual thing? Think about it. Everybody came to these shores to see their riches, or at least a new, a new home, a new land, a new place for themselves and their loved ones. This particular gentleman um, came here under Dutch rule when Stuyvesant still, still ruled the area. Um, when the Duke of York conquered the colony, that's how New York came to be, the Duke of York conquered the colony of New Amsterdam in 1664. He changed its name to New York. Over the years, more colonists entered the region, pushing back the edge of the frontier. Thomas Pell occupied the northeastern section of today's Bronx and much of the southeastern portion of modern Westchester County, which was eventually made into the matter of Pelham. Other settlers purchased some of Pell's property to be in the village of Eastchester, centered around today's Mount Vernon but extending into the northern reaches of the modern Bronx. John Archer journeyed west from Westchester and purchased a huge tract of land occupying most of today's western Bronx that became the manor of Fordham. North of that, Frederick Phillips claimed an even larger tract extending all the way up to the Brooklyn River. That was part of the Bronx, all the way up to the Brooklyn River, and that became the manor of Phillips. Similarly, two brothers named Mark came from Barbados to occupy the land originally settled by Jonas Grump. Now, in English law, the owners of a manor had the right to establish their own courts and maintain exclusive control over mills and their property.
property. As we actually know today, only John Archer established a, a, a port. The territory was still very much a frontier. It was a rough and ready place. There was little or no respect for rank or authority, and few government or social institutions intruded upon their lives. The region did become part of the county of Westchester, and the tiny, tiny village of Westchester now elevated to the position of a town where the town government became the county seat. Yeah, that's Westchester Square, in case you don't realize it. That's where Westchester County got started. Farmers raised livestock to sell at the New York City meat markets and later concentrated on raising wheat to make it the flour to be sold in the West Indies. The untamed society was to be changed forever through the efforts of Kaylee Heathcote, this gentleman right up here. Uh, with his connections, he hoped to establish an outpost of the family's business in New York. And he was quite successful and became quite wealthy. Over the years, he was, uh, he was to occupy many governmental offices, many at the same time. In the early 1690s, he settled in the town of Westchester, becoming both the judge and the commander of the county militia with the rank of colonel. He was horrified by the frontier community. It looks like a dandy there, doesn't it? <laughs> That's a wig, by the way. Most of the people didn't wear that. They could, but I don't think he, he had that kind of hair. Look how long that is in the <laughs> I wonder how hot. You think about how hot it is to wear a hair like that. One major difficulty in this way was the fact that the majority of the population of the town were Presbyterians and Quakers. Nevertheless, Heathcote was aided by his endeavor by Governor Lord Cornbury and by a recently passed colonial law which established the Church of England as the main church, even though there weren't that many there. The governor proved of great assistance with the society for the propagation of the gospel. And they sent Mr. Heathcote, this gentleman, managed to uh, divert one of these uh, new reverends and ministers from the, from the Rye Parish to the town of Westchester. So by 1704, they now had uh, a uh, minister. This began the civilizing of our great area. Some people think it's never been. You know, it's been it never could. But I don't know about that. We have to think kindly, think smart. This is Hell Gate. This is this particular image, Hell Gate. Um, in 1778, as viewed looking east from Manhattan. On the far side is, is Morrisania. You can pick out number five. Can you see number five all the way on the far side? Uh, 65, it should be over here. This is Morrisania. Oh, it's cut off at this spot. This is Morrisania on the southern rocks. Maps are a wonderful thing, especially these old maps. You match them up, it's nothing like it. Originally, this print was part of an insert panel on an engraving called The Chart of the Coast of New England in New York. It was published in London. Map makers had a wonderful time working on the new lands. Uh, here's a guy, he's, uh, doesn't seem to have a wig, does he? Cadwallader Colvin, a Scottish physician who was the last royal lieutenant governor of New York. The people of the Bronx who expressed any religious affiliation in the 18th century were mostly members of the Anglican, Quaker, Presbyterian, and Dutch Reformed churches. When the first Catholic, Charles McDaniel, <coughs> McDaniel settled in the town of Westchester in 1744, a town meeting was called to discuss if he should be allowed to live there, and the inhabitants resolved that it could, provided he took the required or oath of allegiance. Has anything really changed? <laughs> Nothing changed. Almost a decade later, the first Jew, Philip Isaac, settled in Eastchester on a farm in that town. And when he did, no fuss was made over his arrival. Life on a farm in the colonial Bronx was hard, but wealthy and politically prominent families in the area were no exceptions to this rule. This is brought out by the letters that the family of Delancey wrote. This book, by the way, this is, I'm just reading the summaries of the section. This book has diary excerpts, letters, uh, notes, um, uh, business arrangements and transactions. The idea be behind this book, The Life of the Bronx, is to give you a sense of how exactly the borough got started, the place that we live in and love got started. Uh, let's see, we'll drop back down. Here's a letter of Life at West Farm by Elizabeth Colden Delancey. And she says, it's been so dull here, I could hardly think it was Christmas time, though we all should not have been so lonesome. lonesome. I believe, but are intending to go to New York, to preventing, preventing us from having company that should have been here. She 
she's writing in a diary like anyone else would. This, the date was January 2nd, 1745. Let's continue. This is Spikendival Creek and the King's Bridge, two words. But it's become King's Bridge Road, and where we're on, this is King's Bridge Road. This building is on King's Bridge Road. That's one word today. But in fact, the King's Bridge was a real thing. There it is. It was a real bridge. This was depicted in Harper's Weekly in 1873. Today, that bridge and the waterway are covered over, and the site is just south of West 230th Street in Kingsbridge Avenue, right near a playground. Just as you, you look up, and there is Marble Hill. That's where this is. And one day, they're going to dig it up again. They haven't dug up that area now for the last 40 years. We're going to wait to get the word. They'll dig it up and run over there to see if we can get some pieces of the old bridge itself. Colonial Bronx life was economically difficult. It was a difficult one. Of course, large landowners, those allied to the great commercial New York City families, enjoyed their privileges. But no more glaring example of problems was to be found about the King's Bridge. Frederick Phillips created the manor of, of uh, Phillipsburg, and it gave him the right, the family, the right to build a bridge over the Spike of Diver Creek and charge tolls on every person, vehicle, and farm animal which passed over it. The only exception were those people on the king's business. Since the bridge, the first in the area to have a toll, was the only land connection between the mainland, Manhattan Island, and the rest of the world, that's what we like to call it anyway, this is, we're on the mainland. Everybody else is off the mainland. We're on the mainland of the city of New York. So farmers were forced to pay the wealthy Philippe's every time they used the span. So while we say, we sort of made this sound this way, this is really the first toll bridge in the United States, right here in the Bronx. We established it. And almost immediately, people tried to get around it. <laughs> Benjamin Palmer of Throck's Neck was a colonial entrepreneur. He saw opportunities where others could not. His first great project was the building of a free bridge, free bridge, over the Harlem River near the end of modern Kingsbridge, right next to it. Begun in 1758, Completed in January 1759, the new span was obviously in direct competition with the King's Bridge, the Paid Bridge. <clears throat> this was not, it does not go over well with the Philippe's family. Since the project cut into Colonel Frederick Philippe's considerable income, the powerful landowner tried to stop the bridge's construction by twice having Benjamin Palmer drafted for military service <laughs> in the French Indian War. Nothing changes. Nothing changes. Uh, uh, let's see where we are here. Uh, Palmer managed to avoid service. You know how? Back then, you could purchase a substitute. You actually could hire somebody. You could do it right into the Civil War. A substitute to serve for him, a process which was very legal at that time. Following the successful completion of the bridge, Palmer then promoted the development of another great idea of his to convert City Island to the major seaport to rival New York City. Mm -hmm. That didn't work out so well. <laughs> the idea never really reached fruition. But what happened to our bridge here, you might say? Well, it worked. The new bridge worked really well, and Philippe was forced to just take the toll off, and he couldn't do anything else. After the American Revolution, a destitute Palmer continually petitioned various government bodies seeking compensation for the claimed $150,000 in costs, plus interest he incurred for the construction of the free bridge. But every petition was denied. But we still don't agree. This number is way beyond the pen. He must have put a lot of interest into this. <laughs> and then we have a whole piece here on how Palmer described 30 years later how he built the bridge. And who did he write?